Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Prime Talk. Today, I have a special guest. Today, I'm having Kyle Nelson. Kyle is the co-founder and CEO of Result Imagery. Um, Result Imagery is a leading production agency specializing in product photography and video productions, which is hugely popular and important for e-commerce sellers. So, uh, Kyle, welcome to the show. Well, no, man. Thanks for having us. Or me. Oh. My partner, <laughs> so you just say us. <laughs> I'm, having, I'm definitely having you guys today, but uh, you are, you're taking the, uh, the, the hot seat and the spotlight. Mm -hmm. So today's episode is going to be the story of Kyle um, Nelson. So you're going to share with us everything, you know, uh, who you are, cool. uh, where were you born, where'd you grow up, um, how'd you begin your professional career, station to station until we reach to where you are today with the world of e-commerce. Uh, so without further ado, let's jump right into it. Yeah, man. So I was born in Northern California in the Bay Area, uh, in Santa Rosa to be specific. Um, grew up with some parents that were very hardworking. Uh, my dad was one of those double shift dads, always working. So I... Which, uh, which industries was he uh, working at your father? In nursing. So he was working wow. very hard helping others. Uh, I, I, he's a servant. So he... Um, that's what I, how I learned to become a servant and work very hard, uh, but still had a great connection with him. He's one of those type of guys that, um, you know, is a people pleaser. So I learned a lot from my dad uh, at an early age and learned what it was like to um, work very hard for, for money. And so and your mother worked in industries. Uh, no, my mom ask. was working as a, uh, let's see, um, like hospice help. So she was an admin, she was an operations manager um, for hospice in the Bay area. So she was like in corporate America, like, to a T. So they both worked very hard. Um, yeah. Sounds like both parents were in the care take, uh, you know, yeah. taking yeah. care of industries of, uh, yeah. uh, you know, with their, with their, um, uh, with Irving their own, owners. um, yeah, functions. So, okay, go ahead. So, uh, growing up, uh, you moved around or you stay mostly in Northern, Northern California? Uh, so moved to another place in Northern California called Middletown. No one's ever heard of it. Uh, very <laughs> it's Middletown <laughs> in the North. So Northern California. So, uh, yeah. Ironic. Yeah graduated with like 80 people in my in my senior class so uh my roots are in small town uh usa as you could probably think of it um so that that was cool because i i understood what community was at young young age as well i couldn't go to the store without anyone knowing what my business was and that i had a c plus in spanish like it was very much like that everyone knew knew me and um mm -hmm. was uh always uh, AS president, student body, um, student class president, always, always really intrigued by leadership and inspiring others and helping others and kind of taking lead and um, also being a backbone of, of, of my class. So always was that uh, kind of competitive nature four years in a row. And then I was also involved in the Future Farmers of America and um, went to an international or the national scale and, and did a lot of that. Um, so what's that, that really about? Cool. What's, what's the Future Farmer? What's that about? What's the mission? Yeah, there? so what it's the largest. Uh, yeah. So the Future Farmers of America, now it's called the FFA. It's the largest uh, student high school student leadership um, organization in the U.S., uh, so you either kind of do two different things. You either get really into the leadership kind of stuff or you get really into like raising animals and, and farming and stuff. So I did both. So I um, have- Let me understand this. Is Northern California more like a farmland region for, for Yeah, the Northern California very much is. Most people think of the Bay Area, but outside the Bay Area, it's all very farmed. I mean, it, that's it's an ag state, right? It's like one of the number- it is yeah, What kind of produce over there they're, they're making in the, that everything. area, that region? Everything, everything you can think of? Think you can Sonoma think of. Valley. Uh, I, yeah. I think I'm just, is that the area there also? That's Santa Rosa. That's where I grew up was in the Sonoma Valley. Got it. Yeah, it's the wine. It's very famous for the wine, the Sonoma very Valley wine. Great right? wine. Sonoma and Napa Valley. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Now it's, things are starting to click and make sense. Yeah. Um, also for me, a question to you is, um, why was leadership important for you in such an early stage of your life? I think... I think it comes down to two things. I think it was my father watching him because he was like always part of the school board. He was always volunteering and doing everything and saying that he was a leader without trying. I always aspired to be that. Uh, and I always felt like number two, you know, my fuzzy feelings inside me come from helping others getting their fuzzy feelings. And it's just been something natural for me and trying to help people lead um, and become leaders themselves is something I, you know, inspired to do. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's just natural for me, you know, and, after that, I went to college uh, in Northern California, Chico State University. Um, went to school there for uh, business administration with a focus on entrepreneurship. So I honestly have never um, earned a paycheck from someone else. I've always figured it out myself. I've never had a quote unquote job. I've always had my own businesses, always trying to do but, like- But uh, the business that you had were out of college or you- uh, Oh, in college, yeah. No, yeah, I, did you have any other business before college or anything like that yeah. when you were growing up? Well, when I was like 15, I, me and my buddies started um, like a ranch hand kind of thing. So people pay us like 30 bucks an hour to 
do whatever you need on your property, whether it's cleaning stuff up, building things. Um, so always just striving for the dollar. It was always something I've always chased and, you know, just still do today, but, um, yeah. All right, so, so let's hit the years around. I want to start marking the year. So, uh, which uh, year did you start uh, university or college? Um, 2007, I went to college. All right. And you graduated when? 2011. 2011. All right. 2011, your first station after college, professional world. Uh, what'd you do? What was it? Oh, yeah, the business so, world, yeah. Yeah. So I got a $25,000 investment from a doctor that I knew and I started a staffing agency for nurses. Um, because I saw so much potential revenue and, and money that could be made with that. And it was, it was very successful. I did that for about four years, um, right out of college. It was just like a one man business. I had up to 40 nurses throughout all that. And so I was temporary staffing. You mentioned your mother was a nurse, correct? My, uh, no, my mother wasn't. No, she so was a caretaker. You mentioned, right? different. Yeah, she was, that was a whole different thing. But, uh, um, this was a whole, there's like a doctor, family doctor, friend that was a doctor that I knew that had me and she saw the vision and she was like yeah I, I'm gonna bet on you she gave me $25,000 which when I was 21 I thought was like oh my god I don't know what to do with all this <laughs> um, so I was very picky on how to do that but I was just fresh out of college with my degree in entrepreneurship so it was like literally I was living the dream I was like nice. this is amazing um, yeah so started this little temp staffing agency so essentially hospitals have gaps that they need to find temp nurses so I would just pair up calendars and, and do that. And I think I had up to 40 nurses and I was, you know, making, I was charging $150 an hour. I was paying nurses like 80 bucks an hour. And that was my profit margin. There was pretty low overhead. There wasn't much. Um, but I learned that hospitals, uh, their, their payment terms take a while. And so that was where I also learned um, what it's like to stress. What, what's the typical terms for the hospitals? If you give us a little oh, taste man. of that. Like I would have 30 day terms, but they would not pay sometimes for 120 days. And mm -hmm. when the checks are like $50,000, like in your payroll, I mean, you get the story, the payroll's 40,000 and you got the next, it was just very. The payroll, you, you pay bi-weekly, you pay weekly or monthly? Every two weeks pay? we would pay. Yeah, every two weeks. So how'd you uh, gap the, 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 the cash, uh, cash line flow? Of credit. Yeah, so eventually I got a line of credit uh, through Cabbage. Um, just to kind of get a spy, but then you know, cabbage was, was already uh, active back in 2011. No, this was like in 2013 because I did this for a while. As I got yeah. it after a few years. Yeah, today cabbage, I think you probably know they uh, they're owned by uh, American Express. Yep, they got yep. bought out. Yeah, they're, they're um, a totally different company now. So what are you paying? We're paying what 20 percent APR or something like that. Oh, something like that, yeah. So you know, line of credit, it was fee based. So they, I kind of knew what the fees were already, mm -hmm. um, and I would just. Yeah, I was just in the grind. I was just like money. It was, there was no money, right? It was just like floating to other organ. It was floating to cabbage. I'd have a little to pay the nurses and then I'd get this massive check from a hospital. So it, I eventually got out of that and I got into another startup called Soul ID. And what was so it called? Soul ID. And what that was. Soul was ID. So like uh, somebody's soul or uh, like a soul nope. of a shoe? Nope. Nope. Somebody's soul. So uh, let me break it down. I just, I just, I have to say this. I just saw the movie Soul on a flight. Oh, come back, from, come back from California. <laughs> so uh, just a coincidence, man. Yeah. So I, I helped start this company called Soul ID. It was an action sports social network. We had an app. We were in 129 countries, I think. Um, and so pretty much your soul ID, right? So soul, who you are, your ID is what you're, you identify your um, specific action sports. So we had 10 different action sports that this social network was made out of. Um, and so you kind of choose the ones that you identified yourself with snowboarding, skateboarding, all that. And so I ran with that for a few years and I was- Hold on, but this is your business? Uh, I was one of the business partners. So I was, uh, it was co-founded by two guys. And then like in three months, I jumped on board. You jumped on board. And what was your role in with the whole dynamic? Yeah. So I was, I started as a VP of marketing and then eventually over a couple of years, I, we got into the media space and that's starting the story of what, what I do today. I was the director of media and we started producing media for the <clears throat> platform and for other brands like Red Bull, Mountain Dew, bigger kind of action sports brands. Um, now let me get this straight. So you're, you're a VP of marketing and how do you market that social media, right? A social network. It's very hard when you're competing against Facebook. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah, that's say the least, uh, yeah. there's a, a bunch more, but, uh, one second, let me send the model or the purpose of the, the social yeah. network. You have your soul, kind of yeah. your identity and you right. put it out there and that's how they interact. Just what's in their soul. Oh, it's yeah, more, me, more of a spiritual yeah. thing. No, 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 no. Let me break it down. So on the um, network, right? So Facebook, it's inundated with, people that post about their cats, politics, uh, what they just ate, things that we don't care about. 
So we created an action sports social network that was solely dedicated to action sports. And so this was a place where when you went to this platform, all you would see is your favorite action sports. And we had some of the top athletes out there from some of the larger action sports networks, top photographers on there posting. Amazing. Tell me what's an example for action sports as, a, as opposed to regular sports. Uh, motocross, skateboard, snowboard, um, skiing, wakeboarding, longboarding. Those kind of more intense adventure sports. X Games. Do you still have the X Games? Is that yeah, something X that's Games. around? We went there. So we went there and we were one of the sponsors of X Games. Yeah, that was my next question. How do you market that? So yep. that's one one venue. You go to the X Games and you put your, your uh, sign there. You sponsor a few things. What else do you do for, to market yeah, it? Yeah, a lot of word of mouth and asking for referrals. But our biggest thing was we would jump on board with these uh, up-and-coming um, action sports athletes. So people that were just about to sign and we would sponsor them. So they would have their, our logo all over them. And then we would get top athletes on there and telling their networks and different, like on Instagram, and Facebook, say, Hey, come join me on, um, soul ID. So it, it was hard. We did it for five or five years. I think, um, I was doing that in the staffing thing towards the end of the staffing thing. I started doing the soul ID thing. It was about two year, um, gaps. Crisscross. Yeah. very busy. Um, just had a kid at that time, just got married. So it was just like so much was going on, so much stimuli. I was like doing the hustle and all that. And so at a young age, I, I really learned like that chaos, uh, very healthy <laughs> chaos though. Um, but you, feel, you find yourself thriving under chaos or was it overbearing yeah. for you or was no, the cycle no, was I, overbearing and I, you get a, you get by and now I thrive on, on organized chaos for sure. I, I, I don't do mundane I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know what it's like to have a nine to five job. I've never done that. So I can't really relate to people when they talk about that, but I can just yeah. kind of, you know, sympathize. How about, uh, what's it called? Four or five hour work week. There's a Tim yeah. Ferriss book or something like that. Yeah, something that, like that. that, that that's you ever read that or no? I haven't read yeah, it. Yeah, full, full, full. yeah, I read it. That just kind of really teaches you how to like um, outsource your, your work at the end of the day is what it is and gain impact your time. Um, but yeah, let me get this straight. So 2011 until 2014, those three years you're in the, you know, you have your own staffing uh, business, right? Mm -hmm. But already with 2012, you got involved with um, yeah. Soul ID. Like, yeah, it was probably like 2013. I guess the sure. staffing agency was in 2015. So around 2014, I jumped on board with that. And that lasted till 2019, four or five years, 2020 yeah, till the pandemic. It was about 2017. Um, Got it. When I started kind of backing off that, we closed it up. Um, we did have funding for it, but we just decided it wasn't a good route just because Facebook. You did or did not have found? Uh, you did not. You didn't have funding. We had funding. Yeah, it was. I think we had How much did you guys raise? About a quarter million. Got um, it. So it kind of kept us going. Uh, none of us were paying ourselves with Soul ID. We were just like hustling, spending money on development and marketing. Um, so how did you get by financially all uh, these years, especially after you detached from the staffing? Yeah, I had some money from the staffing agency in reserve. And then from the time I wasn't paying myself, I was literally just hustling freelance work. I was writing articles. I was doing SEO. I was doing voiceovers. I was doing anything you could think. I was doing fake video testimonies. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it was I could do to make uh, money, like an extra hundred bucks to buy diapers, I was down. Wow. Um, so grind. It was cool. So yeah, good for you. Good for you. I, I salute the grind. Okay. So let's head into, uh, the, the, I understand there's some sort of evolution into what you're doing today. Uh, so take it to that yep. moment where you're still with soul ID. You may start mentioning, um, the, yeah. the, the activities that, uh, you know, influence things later. So go ahead. Yeah. So, um, in 2017, I decided to do photography full time, January of 2017, to start my own studio in Paradise, California. Um, that's right outside of Chico, Northern California area. And so I opened my own little main street, like on the main road of this small town photography studio. Um, <clears throat> I didn't know a thing about actual, like, I was doing a lot of photography on the side, but I didn't know a thing about actually like doing this full time. And I just went for it because I was at a point in my life where I didn't want to go get a job because I thought I was probably either overqualified. No one wanted me because I hadn't worked for anybody else. Um, and I am somebody that just thrives on doing what I want to do and, and collaborating with others and making decisions. So I did that. And that was a huge leap. I, th I think I got a $12,000 business loan because I didn't really have much money left. Um, my Is that from uh, Cabbage again or that was conventional banking? No, that was just normal banking. I think it's it was through Goldman Sachs. So I got that and uh, I don't know how I got it. My credit score was super low and I had debt, but I just went for it. And that's the most they gave me. So I was like, all right, I'm going to do what I can with this money. And mm -hmm. so very quickly, I 
jumped on board with some local social media agencies in my local area and said, I'll do photos for your clients for like 50 bucks an hour. I'll do whatever. I emailed every single real estate agent. There was like 400 of them and said, Hey, I'll do real estate photography. I blasted. I mean, I went full on bootstrap guerrilla marketing the, the most I could. And within three months, like I, I, I was super, it was thriving. It was doing really well. Um, and then in about a year after that, um, we're talking about already uh, 2018. You started to, to 2017. 20, yeah, in the middle of the 2020. street, middle of the, of the town. Yep. We're in the beginning of 2018. And, mm -hmm. and I, me and my buddy, my current co-founder, he was also part of Soul ID. So I knew him from that. Uh, he was doing his own e-commerce thing um, with a company and was doing this media thing. And I, let's see, the local college that we both went to college to, the business college was doing a career fair. And I reached out to them and said, hey, I will do free headshots for anybody at this career fair. So that day I needed help and I hit them up. I did 400 free headshots just to get my name out there for uh, senior portraits. So I was like, I was thinking, okay, if I do free headshots for these students that are at the career fair, if I get their email, I can email them for senior portraits, which worked. But um, that night, I, that about two weeks before that, I was like, man, how do I like scale a photography business? I want to get into the e-commerce space. It's really big. So that night I went and grabbed a beer with my buddy, Eli. And I said, dude, I got this idea. It's called results photography. What if we were to get into e-commerce photos? Like what if we were just like killed it at e-commerce, like get really good at product photography. And at that but time- But what made you spot at e-commerce? Why was that different? Or why did that right. was, you know, like a, a oh, grab your attention, but what was the reason? Right. So commercial photography, which is what I was doing, like photos for businesses. Uh, and people, that's really just a local thing, right? Like maybe you could do like 120 mile radius, like going after that. Mm -hmm. I didn't live in the Bay Area or LA or New York where there's 10 million people. I lived in an area that maybe had 200,000. So there's only so much business I could get from those areas. And I knew e-commerce was international. And I was like, man, if I could just get half a percent of that market for photography. I could limitless. It's limitless almost. Yeah, I could do really well. And I wanted to get back into the startup world. So that's Pretty much just, I was like, all right, and I'm just going to do it and hit him up. He was super down because he was getting burnt out with his job, um, which he'll talk Hold to. On. So that was the genesis of uh, what you guys are doing today? Yeah, it was just this idea. Result imagery, computer. and this is 2018? Mm -hmm. so what, what, you said he was burned out. So what was burning him out? What kind of job? Or what kind uh, of industry? He, yeah, so he um, founded a brand called Winterial. Um, so it was an e-commerce brand. So I think he had like 300 SKUs, and he was doing uh, outdoor adventure um, items. So like snowshoes, uh, ski goggles, tents, all that backpacking. And I was doing some photography for him on the side to say, Hey man, let me help you out. And he was noticing that when he was posting some of these lifestyle images I was making for him, the moment he would post it, sales would fly up. And the only change he did was photos. And so he was like, dude, you know, it's funny that you bring this up. You've been doing these photos for me. And like, coincidentally, these SKUs that I'm doing your photos with are doing really well. He's like, I think we actually do have something. If we could like share this model or share this like little case study we have with others, maybe they'd be interested. Um, and so he it sounds was like the marketplace was telling you what to do. It was marketplace. This is, is this resonating. This is the data. And you know, keep pulling that thread and see what you find. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. And we were stoked. We're like, okay, cool. We got a new business on our hands. We shook hands, split the company in half. And for, um, yeah. So then there was that, but we still were doing our day jobs, of course, like any startup, it's going to take a year or two unless you got funding. Um, and then a year into that, uh, I, it's kind of more personal thing. Um, I, my house burned down in paradise during the campfire. So the campfire was the largest, uh, fire of uh, the largest natural disaster the world for the world in 2018. Um, so you're talking I about the wildfires that unfortunately strike uh, California, uh, pretty yeah. much every year is at this point. Yeah. So your house burned down completely? Yeah. And so that oh was goodness. that was a complete gut punch for me. And my parents' wow. house also burnt down. Wow, um, wow. So while doing this startup in late 2018, uh, Eli and I were full-time at that point. We had uh, two part-time employees. Um, my house burns down. And my parents' house burned down. And so I'm just like, and I have one kid. Uh, and I'm just like, okay, this is crazy. I need to take some time off and try to figure out what the heck I'm going to do with my <laughs> like I need to find a home. I need to, so that's a, that you was need a to home. find a place to sleep. Like yeah, that's, exactly. that's how bad it is. It's like unbelievable. Yeah. And now just you forget about you, your kid, you want, where, where is your, your kid going to exactly. put the, the head on a pillow, you know? Exactly. So that was definitely part of my story. And, and part of moving forward is, you know, just having resilience and knowing that I'm someone that's always pushed forward and someone that's always, tried to see the positive and, and just like, okay, like 
and I think my entrepreneurial roots helped me that. I had a plan. I was like, okay, we got to move forward. Yes, this is difficult. Yes, 17,000 buildings burnt down and 50,000 people lost their homes, but I got to be someone that moves forward. I can't dwell. You know? What'd you do? How'd what, what, you get yeah. out of this? Uh, well, we're still dealing with it, but, um, wow. Why? This is 2018, three years, uh, into the mix. You're still, uh, yeah, we finally got uh, into a house that we could buy. (laughs) We've been renting. Oh yeah. I forgot. It's California. Stuff is expensive. And probably the past year or two, things became more crazy. Everybody wants to have a house. We live in Oregon now, which I'll, I'll touch on. Got it. Okay. Um, yeah, man, we were just like house hopping with people, Airbnbs, hotels, and finally we got into this piece of junk apartment you know, thank God we had somewhere to live, but, uh, it was really bad, but, um, but in between, like what you went to a friend's uh, houses or a yeah. hotel or a motel think of as long as, as long as I could keep my family out of not sleeping in a car or not sleeping at a cell, um, at the like red Cross shelter, thinner shelter. Those are the two things I would not do. Right. Um, so, so we, crazy. Wow. That's, that's yeah. real life, uh, drama stuff. Yeah, it was, it was very traumatic. And, um, but you know we've rise we've rised up and you know we're we're back at it. But uh, so then there was that that was a big crazy time. And I'm still like the CEO of this company with my business partner, and we're just finally starting to see some like some like cool leads coming in where we're like, wow, we've built something and we have people that are interested in us that we don't even know who they are, how they found us. Like that was really really inspiring for us. We're like, okay, cool. If they think we have a good enough work on our website, and we have enough like sales to be able to talk to people about like wanting to work with us we've got something so i was trying to balance all that and then in 2019 um yeah it was 20 2019 yeah uh my buddy eli had a bachelor party up in central oregon in bend oregon which is a big brewery town we live in the mountains uh, it's really pretty up here um and me and him were like dude what if we like brought the business up here and like well let's start a life up here like that would be cool so we had to so you brought our- californian at that time yeah, we're, Oregon for a bachelor party. You see the yep. surroundings. Let's, we, let's, uh, yeah, let's settle like, here. Let's settle a flag. Here. Yep, exactly. And so we moved up here in twenty. Or, sorry, yeah, twenty year and a half ago. So in twenty nineteen, I don't even post know. Uh, COVID or pre COVID. It was during COVID. Okay, post COVID. Twenty twenty. Yeah, twenty twenty. Yeah, or May of twenty twenty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. Um, so we moved up here May of 2020 and it was just me and him and another business partner that we have. And we kind of just restarted the business. We had already doing really well and you know, COVID, right? Everybody in the e-commerce age, uh, category industry knows that's when most of our businesses really blew up. Like we're all doing good. All the agencies are doing really well. The brands are doing really well. Everyone is just like dumping money in these agencies and services. And like, we got to soup up. We got to be able to be, you know, the top of our game on Amazon. Da, 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 da. So we just see this wave of business that just literally crashed in, in our, in our, you know, right in front of us. And so we hired really quick. We started hiring people up here. We got a small office. Um, and, uh, we just keep seeing all this business and now we're up to 12 employees. We've got 10 um, in uh, India that are editing for us. We've got 12 in-house. We've got a network of photographers and videographers around the U S right now that work with us. And we are literally just seeing crazy growth right now. We're aligning with cool marketing agencies where everyone's talking about these aggregators that are buying up these Amazon businesses. We are partnered. I can't say who, but if you look at the top five aggregators, we're partnered with three of them. So we're seeing all these people needing media services. And so we're just riding the wave. And um, yeah, and we're in Bend, Oregon now. We've got a pretty sweet office that we, we enjoy. And we've got an awesome rock star team that makes what Results Imagery is today um, do so successful and create amazing photos and videos for our clients. How people are truly seeing really good engagement, conversion and sales going up, uh, increased brand awareness, um, just all over the board. So. Nice. I want to touch more into that soon, but I want to go yeah, back okay. to what you said. Uh, 2019, where you guys are kind of uh, getting started, 18, 19, you said it's uh-huh. lots of cool customers came, yeah. came to use you. So what do you mean by cool? What was cool about them as far as you cool, perceived but, it? Cool, uh, but some of them were name brands, like Five Hour Energy Drink hit us up when we were really How did that happen? Give us a little taste of that. So they, so we were starting to, we were starting to test Google Ads. Um, and we noticed that product photography is a very expensive um, Google ad to run against. It's very high competition. Now our account's like super, like it's very competitive. We do really good with our account now. But then, and we were just getting started and somehow Five Energy clicked onto our website and we converted them on our website. That wasn't, it was okay. It wasn't that good. And we were able to show so much confidence that we could put them on a monthly retainer. Excuse me. Bless you. Um, and they, they signed up and uh, 
yeah, that that was like the really cool one. But and what, what kind of uh, what, what, what kind of uh, production did they need? Yeah, so we did everything from lifestyle. So with models, we've done uh, really cool in studio creative stuff. That's like lots of color props, uh, flat lay images, um, mainly stuff for social media. So you think of really high engaging, cool, fun photos on social media that get a lot of engagement. That's the type of stuff we're creating for them. Yeah, when you do, so I guess you have a studio, so you can do all the studio stuff yeah. inside your your facility. But when you do lifestyle, uh, you know, uh, images yeah. and, and production. Well, how do you pick a set? How does that all work? What, what's the dynamic there? Yeah, so we have a production manager and a production coordinator um, that uh, kind of does all the logistics for that. So we have a pre-production with our clients. They tell us this is the type of home we're looking for or location, whatever it is. Uh, we have a database of over 200 models for them to choose from. Um, and then we just start booking up and we do the photo for photo pre-production, try to get the mood of what they're looking for. Um, and yeah, it's just logistics at that point. We partnered up with Airbnb here in uh, the Pacific Northwest um, region of it. And we work with a lot of property management companies. That's in the housing section. We also have like access to you know, any type of office you could think of, gyms, restaurants, whatever you ever need your photo taken in. So the world was a studio for you guys. It's all Literally. open. Yeah, it's really cool. You, you never uh, know what the project we're going to have. So That's very, very cool. Okay, so let's jump back into where yeah. we are today. Um, yeah. You know, I don't sell on Amazon anymore, but here I'm going to be the surrogate of the sellers. Yeah. You know, um, uh, obviously we all understand the need for, for visuals and this and that, but why is it crucial even today? What uh, amplify that for us and, and yeah. uh, on the marketplace level as, and specifically yeah. on the Amazon level, what, what's the, what should they have? Uh, what, uh, what kind of images and what kind of uh, movies yeah. or, or films or videos yeah. or anything else actually you can share with us? Yeah. There's a lot of direct, different directions I could go with this. Um, yep. So at the end of the day, we're seeing a shift to online buying, right? It's been happening for the past three years people no longer shop with their hands. They're shopping with their eyes and their thumbs. They're just looking at photos. At the end of the day on Amazon, if you can get people to scroll down to read your description and like your A plus content, you did a really good job with like your product photos, right? Because you've got them interested in your product. And not only that, a lot of, you know, there's this omni-channel um, experience and marketing that we all have to be aware of. So we have people shopping on Amazon. Let's say they're shopping for a uh, coffee cup. Mm -hmm. uh, they're looking, they type in coffee cup and they see uh, what 15 listings on the first page or 20 listings on the first page. And it's, they're just like inundated. Okay. So I have three of these right here. I'm going to open them each one in a tab. I'm going to compare them. Okay. I think I want to work with, I want to buy this company coffee cup to go coffee cup. What I'm going to do now is, which most, this is shopping behavior. I'm going to open another tab, Google their name, see what their website looks like. Maybe look at social media and try to buy that trust and buy that um, that feeling of wanting to purchase from this company, you know, have that emotional connection, that human element to it to say, okay, I trust this company. I've bought in, I'm going to buy their product. And so the only way to truly speak on an e-commerce, excuse me, omni-channel marketing platform is through media. That's the only way you're going to speak to someone through photo and video. If you can get people to read these days, like captions and all that other stuff, you're doing a really good job through the other visuals. Um, and through Amazon, you know, they have, I think, uh, eight placeholders now. So you can do, we usually say three product on white. So you can showcase the features, uh, a few lifestyle images, an infographic. So whether it's a comparison, a dimension one, a before and after, whatever that is, or just showcase the feature of the infographic, and then a video about a 30 second lifestyle video to really break down. So video is um, a must go. It's standard. No way. You can't live without it. I, I, if you're trying to build brand on Amazon, if you're trying to build product, I don't think so. I don't think you need a video in order to convert people. I think you need really strong photos and a really strong, maybe a couple infographics and, um, and some enhanced brand content. But if you're trying to build brand and try to be known more than just a cup that has, you know, that's just private labeled um, and you really want to like get people to follow your journey and, and, and have that retention of customers, you need video. Because that's going to bring that human element that everyone's looking for. It's going to bring that realness, that rawness of, okay, I, wow, I see myself with this, um, whatever the product is widget i see this person using it I, I feel like i have it it's scenario based um yeah highly recommend video so my, let me uh actually a technical question uh because you mentioned omni channel so uh, if i'm a consumer i open up uh you know amazon i'm on your amazon listing i hit your website so if you really geared up and propped your amazon listing properly it might resonate well but if on the website you basically didn't and it's this one yeah. page with some uh some just content exactly. or words and not the right visuals or media then they're going to have maybe even a discord and say, mm, doesn't exactly. look too legit. 
And maybe the other one, because uh, if I'm comparing it to another one or two and see it's, it's all an ecosystem and it's all resonates the same way, that's how you get your win? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's how I shop and that's how people that I talk to shop. I mean, I, I mean, not everything you buy. I mean, some stuff is just you go on Walmart or Amazon, you're just buying your typical brands that you buy. But when yeah, you're in that, buying uh, disposable cups, you know, as yeah, long as it yeah. has the right ounces or whether you yeah. want it's a commodity. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, but when you're in that, dis- that discovery mode, you're trying to find a new, um, Set like a novel, novel, novelty, or something yeah. cool, a gadget, or the price point is is, is exactly. for them to, to take the take a pause, you know, exactly. before you invest uh, the money in. Yeah, that's exactly it, man. Having that consistency, that that um, uh, having that message consistent across all your different. So you hit the social media, you hit the website, you hit the Amazon listing, and you see that there's some consistency between the media. That must mean they're putting some time into it, and that they're a trustworthy company. Got it. Now, I sent from your model, you guys have a retention, uh, right? A monthly kind of a retention yeah, retainer. or yeah, retainer and uh, I guess more or less a subscri- subscription model. Yeah, yeah. Me as a seller, if I was a seller, but I'm speaking on behalf of the sellers, why would I need that? It, isn't it just like a touch and go, a hit and run kind of thing? I get you my media, I put it on, uh, forget yeah. about you guys. What's the purpose in that or dynamic or relationships you're able yeah. to establish over time? So retainers, um, if you're a 100% only Amazon seller, um, which I know, you, you know that's what you guys work with. Um, I wouldn't say retainer is the most appropriate uh, thing for you. You'd be more using us for just listing images for new products and variations. But retainers are going to be for companies that are D2C going, making Shopify websites, and they're trying to sell hard on there. They're trying to create a very strong presence on social media to build brand. That's where the retainer comes in. So, you know, we'll do 15 photos, 30 photos, 50 photos, depending 100 photos a month for your brand, um, not necessarily just a product, but your brand. Um, every single month, we'll drip them to you. We'll do some videos for you, whatever it is that you need. Um, and companies like that because they're literally getting media dripped to their inbox all month long so they can utilize, they can get ahead of time for sales. Um, I would say, you know, with your listing, you know, every so often, maybe once or twice a year, kind of shake it up a little bit and add some new fresh images. Maybe that speak more to you're finding new market fit or maybe you're finding seasonality works and you put some seasonal images in there whatever it may be um but some companies too uh like some of these larger aggregators that are buying up brands they love re- having us on retainer because they're having new products being launched all the time and so they're just sending us new products on a retainer model instead so yeah one thing i do uh like that i think you kind of mentioned over there is that the ability that to have a, a partner that's always dripping media by your side okay you need to use that for your marketing. So then you can feed your social media channels all the time, you know, exactly. and, and, and drive traffic to Amazon listings or e-commerce, uh, you know, yep. webpage. If you have a, a Shopify website, for example, I got to keep nourishing and, you know, lifestyle videos, cool videos or images. Oh. I think that's uh, uh, critical if you're really trying to build a brand that resonates and talks to, uh, to consumers. So mm-hmm. uh, yeah, now it makes sense. You know, t- I think it makes yeah, total sense to have uh, yeah, that the ability. Uh, I know that I would like to have that because um, if you're just, you know, relying on PPC and just Amazon, which is cool, right. but you, should, anyway, but if at the end of the day, you really, your ambition is to build a brand and, and be able to communicate with, um, your, your audience and your consumers and, um, your customers, uh, you gotta communicate. And the best way to communicate is good visuals, good media. Yeah. Uh, and you do it, uh, in a wide range. Cause uh, it's very rare that you just call, you know, your consumers, you all day on the phone with them. So the way you communicate is, you know, through, through media, social media and, 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 and marketing channels. And every image uh, signals an ambiance, uh, some sort of a message uh, resonating. So that becomes critical to have the right partner for that. Um, talk to me about uh, Biz Pros Podcast. What's that about? What? Uh, how did this uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. you know, come to life? So about three years ago, me and my buddy Eli, my co-founder, uh, we wanted to start getting into podcasting because everyone's talking about podcasting. Build a brand. Da, 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 da. We're following Gary V. We're all excited about it. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> we uh, started this podcast called The E-Commerce Buzz. And we noticed that for us, there was almost so much e-commerce we could talk about that everyone else was talking about too. So we shifted it after 20 episodes to biz bros because we're business guys, we're bros at the end of the day, we're just like normal people just having a good time building business and stuff. So and let me get this straight. You're not biological brothers, but on the business no, side no, of no, things, no. you guys are bros. So biz bros. Yeah? We're, just, we're just biz bros. We're not brothers, although we get that asked a lot. Uh, mainly because when he's got his glasses on, he has literally almost dressed identical. You would think we're brothers. Uh, yeah, you have kind of the same one. I first saw you guys. You're both uh, yep. kind of sitting with the same microphone. Microphone stand. It's like uh, I didn't know if my my screen was uh, cut out. You know, it was, it was uh, duplicating itself. But uh, yeah, it's kind of similar. Yeah. yeah. So we started that, and the number one reason um, outside of business or excuse me, brand building 
is we wanted an easy way and an easy platform to absorb knowledge. And this was a way for us to interview people, thought leaders, interesting topics, whether it's about building culture, leadership, um, anything, every personal development, uh, marketing trends, everybody you could think of, we've had them on the podcast now, just so we can learn and then share with others what we're learning. And, and it's been such a cool, cool experience. I think we're at 100 and 30 episodes, but we have about 160 taped. And so it's just a place for us to just learn and talk to people and, and, and build our brand as well, having cool conversations and, and giving input and stuff. But uh, end of the day, it's just us learning, talking to cool people and, and trying to further our stuff as business leaders um, and sharpening our own tools. So, it's nice. kinda, so uh, it's let's, from three years of business, let's try to, if you can, and bring us the three biggest things you learned uh, from the podcast, from uh, Biz uh, Pro, uh, Bro's podcast okay. that are taught you kind of, if you you know, look, look back into the three years, package it for us in a nutshell, mm-hmm. give us a little taste. Uh, one is going to be resilience, never giving up and always pushing forward. Um, the next thing is celebrating failures, uh, not just successes. That's very big. You can't have a failure bring you down. Um, and the third thing is, you know, uh, for me personally is, Sometimes you need to stop looking so deep into the analytics and the data and go with your gut. Because a lot of times you are who you are and the decisions you make is honestly a gut feeling. And most of the time it's going to be right. Even though data and analytics might say something different, usually your intuition can push you in the right way. And as we all know, like data and analytics, they can change drastically within two seconds. It's like, oh, something happened. So those are kind of my three things. I'd say intuition, resilience, um, and celebrate failures. I'm trying to count on my finger. Okay, let me see if I got this. So resilience, celebrate your uh, failures, and, um, you know. Intuition. Yeah, yeah, intu- intuition. Uh, I mean, with uh, with all things fail, especially data, you got to, you know, uh, um, mm-hmm. trust your gut and intuition. Yep. Very, very cool. Thank you for that. Um, Okay, but uh, in terms of uh, celebrating failure, how do you do that? Give us an example of that. So anytime in our office that there's a success, we have a gong. So people hit the gong all day long. We're hitting the gongs. We're celebrating. But when there's a failure, we bring it to attention. We say, okay, what happened? And the reason why we break this down is when there's failures in your company, that is where that there are systems and processes that are broken and there's leaky pipes that you need to fix and rebuild. And that's how you're going to find real growth because you're creating systems and processes that you're learning. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. this client wasn't happy. This happened for a reason. It wasn't just because they're waking up on the wrong side of the bed. I mean, yeah, we have those clients every so often. Everybody does. But for the, for the most part, there was something in the process that was broken. And so we need to go in there, fix it, build it stronger, build stronger foundation in that process. And that's going to help us move forward with retention and growth. So that's so it sounds like you, yeah, you study your failure mm-hmm. and then you hopefully grow from it. And that's how you celebrate the yep. failure. We celebrate it as we're seeing that the failure found us a process that was broken and we built it even stronger and put all our resources into it to build it up so that won't happen again and then we just keep finding those other failures and processes that need to be fixed so very cool i love that i love that okay so i want to kind of uh, package the episode to see what we got so far oh. and uh, uh head into the last round so born and raised in northern california middletown um went to school 2007 until 2011 uh, I think, I believe you mentioned you did, uh, you know, business and entrepreneurship. And then 2011, uh, off, off of school, you hit uh, uh, your own business right away with, uh, you know, uh, staffing from 2011 until about 2014, 15. But in between, I believe around 2013, you started, um, you know, your own business with, um, uh, ID. with yeah, with what? Yeah, with Soul the Soul ID. ID, yeah, the social network. And then that happened to about, you know, all the way to 2017. Um, you know, you guys raised about 250,000, you tried your best, uh, you, and in between, you know, I'm taking your salary. So you were getting by whatever you can, uh, you know, giving fact testimonials, for example, or whatever you can get your hands on to make a come to make an earning, uh, admirable by the way, 2017, uh, you, you know, you put everything aside you and you will start afresh and you, you, in the middle of the town, you open up a shop for photography, you know, doing media visuals and, and, and uh, videos. Um, and then around 2018, you meet uh, your partner, correct? Mm-hmm. And then uh, you yeah, met up with him for a beer. Yep. Yeah, met for a beer. And then 2018, you guys uh, come with the idea to, um, you know, to create the current business with result imagery. And then uh, 2019, right? There's a big fire. Uh, you know, it kind of mm-hmm. struck you hard. 2018, sorry. And then it struck you pretty hard. And then uh, 2020, you uh, already decided to, uh, you know, pandemic hit. You went to a bachelor's party of your partner. You already uh, settled in Oregon, the great state of Oregon. 
Uh, and 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 to, you know, 2020 and 2021, e-commerce exploded through the roof, and you guys, uh, you know, experienced tremendous growth. The focus is helping you know these brands grow in e-commerce um, and bringing in all the uh, maximizing all the benefits of uh, you know, having the right media set, uh, you know, uh, in, in the seller's hands and the entrepreneur's hand. Did we get everything? Did we get everything correctly so far? I think so. Very, very cool. So thank you so much for sharing. I uh, enjoyed it. I actually learned a lot, so I appreciate it. Now I want to finish up with two things, right? The first thing will be is if somebody wants to reach out and connect, you know, give them a handoff or where can they find you? And the last thing will be is what is your uh, message of hope and inspiration for entrepreneurs listening out there? Yeah. Uh, first place would be go to resultsimagery.com or just uh, hit me up on LinkedIn, Kyle Nelson. I'm very active on there, just like everyone else. Uh, and I think my, my message of hope and inspiration is... Um, you know, if you if you have a gut feeling that you think you have an idea for a business, go for it. Don't give up. Don't get started tomorrow. Get started today and take that first step. And uh, always, always run with passion in, in your hand. Don't ever run with something that's going to burn you out. Just run with passion and that fuel will always continue. Got it. You're passionate about it. Don't wait. Don't procrastinate. Start it. Start now. Keep the passion going. I would also borrow from what you said earlier from the three years of the podcast. Yep. Have resilience. Celebrate the failures. You know, grow from all of them uh, and become better. Beautiful stuff. All right, Kyle. So I'm wishing you and the whole team, you know, great success. And also for the podcast, great having you on today. I hope uh, everybody else enjoyed and had a good time. Stay safe and healthy. Until next time. Thanks, man.